Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. I'm your host, Hao Tran, the CEO and co-founder of Vietcetera, of course. Thank you for tuning in every single Tuesday morning to hear another episode of our show. Uh, we're in the midst of season three, and you might hear that there are quite a few trends emerging this season. I think um, po in this post-COVID world and this transition that we're going through, there's a lot of emphasis on issues such as supply chain, logistics, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, energy, actually. And for those of you living here in Vietnam or even elsewhere, we're feeling the impacts of that, certainly with um, efficiency, but also inflation and other kind of energy concerns. Uh, and we want to kind of showcase what we could look forward to. I think we all know uh, kind of uh, the immediate kind of impacts at the gas station and at the pump, for instance, um, for, the, for the consumers. Uh, but largely speaking, how is it impacting the economy, the industry, and of course, with a, a view on Vietnam specifically. Um, I've got two experts on the show here today. Um, they are partners of GIZ, um, uh, working at GIZ or partners of. Uh, we have Mr. Clemens Leitgob. He is the Managing Director of E7 Energy based in Austria. Clemens, thank you for tuning in this, this morning. Uh, we also have Marcus Bissell. He is the uh, Head of Energy Efficiency at GIZ here in Vietnam. And you guys might be wondering what GIZ stands for. Um, I'll let Mr. Marcus kind of explain in German first and then translation in English, Marcus. So GIZ stands for Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GmbH. And actually the translation uh, of this uh, name is German Development Corporation Agency. Very good. And you guys, of course, have operations here in Vietnam, and I'm sure are doing some uh, fairly large scale projects that maybe the average person doesn't know about. Uh, but I'm sure the industry is well aware of, and we kind of want to dive into that today. Uh, but before we go into the specifics, uh, Marcus, I, I guess my first question for you guys and, and Clemens as well, uh, but I'll start with Marcus here. Um, tell us about what GIZ Vietnam is, uh, and then we'll start with uh, you and then Clemens, if you could share afterwards as well. Yeah, I shared already the, the name of uh, GIZ, and I would like to start a bit uh, broader what GIZ worldwide is doing. Uh, so GIZ is a federal enterprise and supports the German government, uh, in particular the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, in achieving its objectives in the field of international cooperation, like I mentioned at the beginning. So we are active in around 120 countries worldwide and have around 20,000, uh, 25,000 employees. Our um, approach is always to cooperate quite close uh, with the people from the different countries. So that's why we always uh, uh, try to focus on national stuff. Uh, in, in, in average, we have around 70% of national stuff. And particularly, uh, GRZ Vietnam uh, provides advisory services to the government of Vietnam in three priority areas. So first, this is vocational training. We have a big uh, project there in the south of Vietnam. Uh, the second area is environmentally policy and sustainable use of natural resources. And the area we would like to talk on today is the energy sector. So I'm, I'm part of the energy support program. At the moment we have around 60 employees working in the energy sector and try to support the ministry or the Vietnamese government to uh, improve the energy efficiency and also to increase the share of renewable energy in Vietnam. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus, for sharing that. And out of a team of 60 experts, I'm sure you guys need all the support you can get. Energy is much more than um, than what people think. Uh, Clemens, maybe you can share about your role uh, as the managing director of uh, E7 and how you guys partner with uh, GIZ uh, to kind of facilitate these support programs. Uh, perhaps just as a personal introduction, introduction, I'm working in the, let's say, energy sector already for I would need to count 25 plus years. So I see myself as an energy economist dealing a lot with energy efficiency and renewable energy sources. Precisely the topics that Marcus mentioned as focus areas of the GIZ activities uh, in this field in Vietnam. And in this um, role, uh, we have been engaged as uh, consultants to support uh, the um, let's say, development, enhancement of the energy efficiency market here in Vietnam. 
because it's much about organizing efficient use of energy and also uh, use of renewable energy sources by market-based instruments. And this is uh, my role and the role of uh, the team of our company uh, in supporting uh, Marcus and his team in this field. Excellent. Thank you, Clemens, and of course, Marcus, for sharing that overview. Uh, let's dive right in. Uh, where does Vietnam sit on the world energy map? Um, Marcus, I'll start with you. Yeah, so this is actually a quite interesting, quite interesting question. Where uh, does Vietnam stand in, in comparison with other countries uh, worldwide? So, um, you know, uh, energy transition is a quite hot topic. And we always use there an indicator to see how uh, where Vietnam stands, actually. And uh, it's issued on an annual basis from the World Economic Forum. And there, the energy transition of Vietnam is uh, uh, they are ranking on the 65th place from 115 economics. So in the, uh, I would say, last third, uh, the Vietnam is still ranking. So that means there's still a lot of things to do to improve in Vietnam. What is uh, uh, very impressive or what, what was very impressive during the last uh, two, three years. So the increasement of share of renewable energy because there was a feeding tariff. That means people who installed a solar rooftop, for example, they got some uh, uh, money from the government. And uh, yeah, during the last two years, there was a rapid um, increase up to 20 gigawatt within two years. And, and this is uh, worldwide seen from, from all the countries, which was really impressive. Um, what is also quite impressive is uh, already the, the share of renewable in, in general, because it's not only solar, it's also hydropower. Uh, the share for the um, power capacity, it's around 28% for hydropower already, plus the solar power, which is uh, in comparison to other countries, uh, quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, um, for, for me, I've been living in Vietnam for a long time, and uh, I've seen the progress of uh, everything from wind turbines uh, to solar energy being adopted, not just by consumers, uh, but, um, you know, industry, commercial uh, it's quite phenomenal, perhaps one of the fastest growing of the world, uh, which leads me to my my next question, and I'll have this for Clemens here. Um, how about on the world energy saving map? Um, I, I know this question could relate to both consumers and, and businesses, but what are the energy kind of saving practices here compared to the world? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Um, yeah, I have to say perhaps I'm not the best person to answer here because um, uh, my uh, knowledge uh, on how far Vietnam really is, is a bit limited uh, to the project I'm doing here. But uh, it seems to me that uh, generally uh, energy efficiency, I mean efficient use of energy, seems to be much more difficult than uh, pushing forward the increase of renewable energy sources uh, um, and at the end, uh, we need uh, them both. Yeah, this is not something specifically for Vietnam. It's something that is uh, that is a general statement uh, all over the world that uh, just pushing forward renewable energy sources will not lead to a sustainable energy transition. We need a continuous. And this I really want to underline a continuous improvement of uh, energy efficiency through all sectors. And here we also need uh, uh, market models that work in this, uh, in this respect, that, uh, that offer services to, to different customer segments. Because energy efficiency, I mean, I've worked in this sector for many, many years, is a bit a difficult topic. I don't know the English expression, how to say it in uh, in German, I would say you need, so muss man dicke Bretter bohren. Markus, can you help me in translating this? Uh, how, how, would, how would you say it? Drill thick breaths. Yes. So, so, 
it's it's really a, a very very difficult topic because you you can't see energy efficiency yeah if you install a pv oh, wonderful you see it if you install a wind turbine oh beautiful mm. it's almost like in medicine you have treatment and then you have prevention right i think a lot of people are focused on treatment because Obviously, people want innovation, which is excellent. That, that's definitely the driving force and what gets people excited. But at the same time, prevention. Uh, so I guess, you know, in the energy world, what that would be energy saving. It's not as cool. It's not as like it's it's hard to change practices. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. yeah it's, you're, it's a good analogy, I have to say. Mm. I never thought of it. I will use it in the future. There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, Innovation on our show right here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I think it's easy to kind of communicate to consumers that way too, but also businesses, yes. especially those in Vietnam, you know, on the topic of how, yes, how is Vietnam yes. sitting in the world saving map. Uh, actually, Asian mentalities in Vietnam, uh, specifically, if you look at the whole COVID history the last two years, it's been excellent at prevention. You know, people uh, are, are adopting, you know, masks. And um, if you look at, you know, COVID cases obviously rose uh, once Omicron hit, but in the beginning, they were really good at prevention, whereas treatment was always seen as a solution um, elsewhere uh, for other re many, many reasons, of course. But let's not go into that specifically. Let's take this analogy. I think what is uh, missing in order to push forward uh, energy efficiency is the crisis. Yeah, because uh, energy is there. Yeah. So the energy consumption is growing and as long as the economy is, is able to satisfy the increasing demand, there is no crisis about that. So it's, it's more about um, understanding that it's an important contribution to energy transition in the long run. And uh, of course, we as, as human beings are, have some difficulties to think uh, in long term. Yeah. And then, of course, as I said, it's a complicated topic because you need energy everywhere. If you just think of your household where you need energy. In Vietnam, it will be uh, electric appliances, it will be cooling. In some regions, it's also heating. Uh, um, then you have hot water. And uh, so you have uh, different fields uh, where we all, uh, everywhere see the need to get more efficient in order to be able at some point in time to cover our energy demand really by a large share. I mean now really 80, 90, uh, perhaps even more percent with renewable energy sources. This is energy transition at the end. And you see, this is uh, really a huge challenge. Marcus, I, I want to follow up on that. Um, of course, you're the, you're, you're the one here in Vietnam. You're uh, sitting, uh, uh, you know, on the team here at GIZ Vietnam. Um, what are some effective methods that you've seen, that your, your team has seen, that the country is working on in this idea of energy efficiency and saving in practice? Before I respond, I would like to follow up on the uh, comments from Clemens. Uh, that, uh, energy efficiency needs crisis. I, I totally agree. But you can see it now in, for example, in Germany. I, I recently was in Germany in my hometown. Yeah, you know, we are depending very much on, on the gas and oil import from Russia. And of course, everybody can provide a, a small contribution to show that he's, he or she is against this war. Uh, just use less energy, le less gas, or uh, use uh, less the, the car, and so on. But indeed, nobody do it, really. So that, that's really a pity. Uh, this could be a small contribution from, from everybody, actually. I have to say, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, before we go back to Vietnam, uh, as a consultancy, we see that the demand for uh, moving away from gas here in Austria is increasing tremendously. Uh, we have so many uh, uh, people who are asking us, what can I do? And we try to help them. So a crisis is always something that pushes us forward. Unfortunately, as, as human beings, we, we seem to need this a bit. But as you said, prevention would be better not to wait uh, till you are ill, but uh, to think before. And this is what we try with our work. 
with some success, I would say. And Marcus, what are those successes in Vietnam? Uh, you know, the, the Vietnamese government, they, they issued uh, the Vietnam National Energy Efficiency Program. So that was the first one from 10 to 2015 and Vietnam National Energy Efficiency Program from 2016 to 2020. So there were a lot of uh, measures uh, described how the industry and also the households can save energy and what the government do for this. So, and there are definitely some achievements, for example, uh, with the Vietnam Energy Efficiency Program 1, uh, the, the, the country saved 3.4% uh, energy and uh, for the VNEP 2, they saved 6.5% uh, energy. So this is already a success and, and there were different methods uh, the government applied. So for example, there is a very, um, let's say, comprehensive legal framework on energy efficiency, very much focusing on the industry, industrial companies, because they consume around 50% of the en national energy consumption in Vietnam. So they're trying to um, yeah, provide capacity building programs uh, for those industrial companies and they also uh, promote technology transfer with uh, international companies. And so these are just some examples uh, the government of Vietnam applied in Vietnam and which were quite successful. However, they are not enough. Let's talk about also for private businesses. How could they assist in that um, eventual transition or gradual rather? So it's all up to the decision maker from my experience. Uh, I, I just, uh, we had the, we called it public talk, where we had a discussion at the Hanoi University of Science and Technology, where we presented uh, yeah, the current status of energy efficiency to the students there. And there was also a, a nice uh, lady, actually she was 75 years old already, a Vietnamese lady. She's a CEO of a cosmetic uh, company producing cosmetic here in Vietnam, and uh, we supported her last year. And she was very much interested in energy efficiency and she pushed this topic in her company uh, forward with 75 years and, and she was so enthusiastic on, on this topic of energy efficiency and she really achieved a lot of uh, energy savings in, in her right. company but sometimes on the other hand you you have uh, ceos uh, of uh, industrial companies which are not interested in energy efficiency, saving energy. They don't see the benefit. They are focusing on uh, the production. They want to increase their production, but not really uh, to produce more efficient, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So from my, uh, from my perspective, uh, the decision maker of the companies, you need to find out who's the decision maker first. Uh, these are the people you should focus on. I think efficiency can be uh, misunderstood sometimes as simply saving energy for the sake of saving energy. But I think it's also about increasing productivity, which is essentially making more money, but also being more efficient at the same time, uh, which leads me to my my next question. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with Marcus and I'll have Clemens comment here as well. Um, what are some of the internationally proven ways of saving energy that could work in Vietnam, but haven't yet been utilized? So maybe Marcus, you can Name a couple of those potential uh, kind of options, proven ways, and, and Clemens, if you can comment how that works in practice. Start with start with Marcus here. Yeah, I, I also used to work uh, for more than 25 years in the energy sector, and uh, I used to work for German utilities, and uh, there we also advised our customers to save energy. And we, we started around, uh, I would say, 10 years ago, um, and uh, it was all pushed by the government at the end. So they forced the utilities to uh, to support their customer to save energy. This was the first uh, big step, I would say. Um, and the second step was actually there was some incentives. So um, if you conducted, for example, um, energy audits in, in Germany, specific energy audits based on international standards, then you get you got some tax incentives. And that's pushed the market and that's, that's raised the awareness. So coming back to the decision maker, of course, their interest, they know if we can reduce the taxes, then they will follow up and they are interested in this. And so, so then energy efficiency was an important topic in the companies. 
Uh, Clemens, perhaps you can comment on that as well. I mean, things like uh, incentives, how, how does that work in practice? I would like to follow up with uh, uh, Marcus' remark, uh, remarks. Um, um, I think we have to be um, realistic in that sense that energy use uh, will never be a priority for a company, hardly a priority. I mean, if you are an energy intensive industry, like uh, steel industry, cement industry, whatever, then of course, yeah. But for uh, most businesses, energy use uh, is just um, a tiny thing in the whole game. And uh, usually, I mean, if you are a good manager, you focus on the important things. Yeah. And energy use is not uh, the most important. So, if you want to uh, improve energy use, because as a, if you look uh, at it from a to top-down perspective for the whole economy, you see that uh, this is necessary, then you need to apply policy instruments. Uh, and Marcus mentioned this policy instrument. Policy instruments help to, uh, to produce interested parties in the game which uh, would not uh, show up without uh, this policy support, as I said before. And Marcus mentioned two policy instruments. Uh, one uh, is uh, taxes, like emission taxes or energy taxes. Uh, the other he also mentioned is uh, the obligation of uh, parties uh, like in Europe, a uh, very widely used instrument obligation of uh, energy utilities to support their customers in saving energies, in offering services that help their customers to save energy uh, against a certain target which they have to fulfill. Yeah, And of course, um, these kind of instruments uh, would also help in the Vietnamese context. In this, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, Vietnam is not different to other countries that you need uh, to, to have someone who is really has an interest in saving energy and brings in this interest in the whole game. And utilities may be... Um, um, a good interested player um, and uh, because they can also then work as energy service companies and we have seen this development in, in, in Europe that many utilities of course they are still supplying energy to their customers but in addition to that they also uh, provide energy services uh, in the sense that they help customers to use uh, the energy more efficiently um, and these services are um, very well accepted on many markets in different sectors let's let's go back to um, what what you the two of you and your teams do uh, with and within G GIZ as well um, I mean aside aside from raising awareness information uh, what we're doing on today's show uh, through public forums and training. Uh, what else is GIZ Vietnam doing to support the country's energy efficiency goals here in Vietnam? Marcus, I'll start with you. Yeah, firstly, I would like to mention that we always, uh, in our project, cooperate with political partner. So we are closely cooperating with Ministry of Industry and Trade of uh, Vietnam here in Hanoi. So because they are responsible for the energy efficiency in, in Vietnam. So, and we always cooperate quite close and develop different measures uh, because they have the knowledge of the energy sector, the best knowledge of the energy sector in Vietnam. So, how we work usually, um, we are working on, we call it action area. Like you mentioned, it's capacity building. Uh, the second one is legal and regulatory framework. And the third one is technology cooperation. Um, I would like to give you some examples for, for example, uh, capacity building. So what we just recently um, published um, is a website, a website for the key person in the energy efficiency sector. These are the energy manager, and energy auditor. So the energy auditor are the people which conduct the audits. So they help them to find, uh, they help the, the companies to find the energy efficiency potential. 
and the energy manager are appointed person from industrial companies. So we provide them with information uh, about energy efficiency, but also we created a forum where they can exchange um, on, on different topic. And, and there we have already 800 um, member registered and uh, there's quite a lot of traffic in, in this forum now. Of course, uh, still need improvement, but uh, it's a good starting point, I would say because you can learn from each other. So this is, from my experience, uh, the, the most or one of the best uh, approach to increase the capacities. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, um, legal and regulatory framework is the second action area. There we are supporting on uh, MIT on, on important uh, legal documents. There is an energy efficiency law. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, degree, degree 21, uh, which is actually the implementation of the energy efficiency law. With our international experience, we provide um, inputs to, to amend it or to, um, yeah, to amend it, actually. And uh, last but not least is technology cooperation. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we can learn from each other and the technology is internationally available. So, uh, um, and uh, therefore we, we try to match make, um, let's say, international companies, technology provider with Vietnamese companies to, to apply those uh, yeah, proven technologies. I think all these initiatives, uh, such as business matching, information sharing, technology transfer, um, all great initiatives. But let's talk about the, the one thing that we could do, which is to really clear up misconception. Um, of course, information is important. But let's talk about the top misconception, was, which is that clean energy, uh, or just being energy efficient, rather, uh, is expensive. Uh, we touched upon it before that at the end of the day, people care about productivity, increasing production, uh, at the end of the day, making more money. Um, what do you two want to tell Vietnamese business leaders uh, today on today's show um, about this? misconception is it expensive and if it is um you know if people are willing to make that investment what are the returns they can make later so let's let's talk about that um clemens i'll start with you yeah a very difficult question because what you are touching is uh, what are the technical measures behind um, energy efficiency so what do you need to do in order to save energy uh, and of course, there is a wide, wide, wide range. In some cases, it's just behavioral measures which are not expensive at, at all. But of course, uh, if you go uh, into a company where energy consumption is um, is caused by the certain by use of technologies and then you very soon will find out that you need to replace certain technologies. And then, of course, it becomes expensive. At the end, energy efficiency is always a replacement of energy use by capital investment and know-how. When you are at this point that you need to invest capital, then, then I would say uh, it's not about expensive or not. It's more about economically viable so the economic dimension comes in here generally i would say in most cases energy efficiency is a good economic decision yeah uh, and uh, it's not uh, the case that you make once an uh, energy saving measure and then that's it you have to uh, follow up continuously because technology is developing know-how is developing uh, so it's a continuous process of uh, improvement um, and, um, and of course you always need expertise. Uh, Marcus mentioned these energy audits. Uh, simply uh, e efficient use of energy is, is a matter of expertise. You, you need to have experts about that who know the technologies, who know how to apply the technologies correctly. And you need to bring in this expertise and uh, energy audits are, are one way to do this in a company. Therefore, I'm, I think it's a good starting point that, um, that in Vietnam uh, companies have to do these uh, energy audits, also compulsory. Uh, and experts will help you to select the most economic measures uh, from those that are less 
uh, economically viable. So no simple answer to this simple question. Marcus, um, I, I want to frame the question in a, in a second way as well, you know, expensive, not expensive. Um, but most of these business leaders that are open to it, they might be asking, how long is the return on that investment? Is it is it years? Is it decades? Is it immediate? Is it, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's different phases of measuring that. But to, to follow up on that question, how do you answer that? Yes, I have a very clear answer on this, uh, actually, um, because... Uh, we supported uh, eight companies recently for for one year and helped them to find energy efficiency opportunities or solutions and uh, um, so we helped them also to implement um, and uh, uh, at the end we found out uh, around 60 energy efficiency measures uh, there of uh, around uh, 60 or 70 percent implemented within one year and the return of investment was less than one year for for those measures in average and uh, the the companies itself they they implemented the measures because they had the trust to the companies where where they were supported by from the energy auditing company and with also the international support so and they mm -hmm. trusted the, the companies and then they implemented the measures uh, of course, those were not investment intensive measures. They were more the low hanging fruits. We call it low hanging fruits. So where the energy saving potential is, is quite high with a, with a small investment. But there uh, we found out that the energy, um, yeah, the, the, the saving were quite, quite high. And um, we also calculated one interesting number. It was the uh, investment per saved kilowatt hour. So, and this was around uh, seven dollar cent per saved kilowatt hour, and for this you cannot buy electricity from the grid. So those uh, investment in the savings were lower than the electricity costs when you buy it from the grid. It's, it's this are uh, experience from Vietnam. So where the low hanging fruits uh, are very obvious, you cannot apply this in Europe, but for a developing country or emerging country like Vietnam, these are some numbers which are proven. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. And um, my last question here today is in regards to the recent uh, COP26 uh, conference convention uh, uh, not too long ago. Um, and here, Vietnam made a commitment as well. Uh, how, uh, how important and what role does energy efficiency play in regards to that commitment uh, for net zero carbon emissions? phasing out coal, how important is energy efficiency? Um, I'll let uh, Clemens comment and then and then Marcus. Uh, yeah, no, no, of course, I, I can uh, quickly say uh, my personal opinion. I mean, uh, when I started in the energy efficiency field, I, I, um, my former boss was one who always said the most important energy carrier on the world is energy efficiency. Uh, so it's more important than coal, more important than gas. And uh, you can show this by figures. Yeah, When you do uh, worldwide analysis, then you see uh, already now uh, um, the continuous flow of energy savings uh, over time contribute to energy security much more than new resources which you find in coal or in gas or whatever. This is the energy security part and the more it is important than also for reducing CO2 emissions or uh, climate gases. I think uh, without energy efficiency this is a game which we surely will lose um, as a country like Vietnam but also worldwide uh, therefore, um, uh, we, we shall not forget this opportunity, I would say, for us uh, and for the whole e economy um, and focus on that together, of course, with the, uh, with the increased use of renewable energy sources. Yeah, maybe I can add one, one comment on this. Uh, actually, we as GIZ, uh, we are very happy that uh, about the commitment of the Prime Minister at the COP26 um, because there is now really a 
a big uh, momentum, big movement in Vietnam. We can we can feel it everywhere. Everybody everybody is thinking about how to achieve the, those uh, goals and and need and ask for support. Uh, when I say everybody, I mean uh, the the government. Uh, they, they are looking now for support and. Uh, but still, unfortunately, everybody is talking about renewable energy. And uh, like, like Clemens mentioned, energy efficiency should be a, a big part of this, of this energy transition to net zero and uh, coal phase out to clarify this uh, role of energy efficiency within uh, the energy sector and, um, and be part of the energy transition. Excellent. It's a it's a constant uh, you know work in progress. I think um, all companies. Uh, governments, organizations are, are moving toward that direction. Um, we are living it at the moment, and I, I hope to, to see more advances. Uh, if I have you two on the show a year from now, we'll be commenting on how much progress we've made. Um, Clemens, Marcus, thank you for joining today's episode of Vietnam Innovators, talking about energy efficiency and innovation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, yes. Through the support of the German government, the GIZ Energy Support Program aims to accelerate Vietnam's sustainable and efficient energy transition. Under ESP, the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Project supports the Vietnam's Ministry of Industry and Trade and related energy stakeholders on three action areas. First, legal and regulatory framework. Second, capacity development. And third, technology cooperation and together for a better energy future in Vietnam.